All right, welcome everyone to uh, the second lecture of this Building Planets series. This is the eponymous lecture called Building Planets. I'm Lindy Elkins Canton, and it's so fun to share this science, and uh, I'm really glad you could come today. All right, recall where we ended our last discussion. Uh, let's see, first I have to do this. There we go. Uh, we were looking at this period of time last time. Uh, recall that we're looking at this timeline back to 5 billion years before the present and the time of the first solids in the solar system at 4.567 billion years ago. And we were looking at about the 10 million years before the first solids. And so what we did in the last lecture was talked about how giant molecular clouds, and here's a picture of one in the infrared, collapsed due to nearby shocks down into spinning protoplanetary disks with the proto-sun in the middle and the planets beginning to form around the outside. And then we talked about the very, very first solids, the same one that gives the 4.5673 date, in fact, from the same meteorite, Allende, in this picture, uh, that first solid to come out of that gas and dust disk. So this is where we ended the last discussion. But here's the paradox. In fact, there are paradoxes here that we're going to talk about today. It's some science that's really not settled, which I think makes it much more interesting. Planets need to form from this gas and dust. And by looking at other solar systems uh, forming in our galaxy, we know that the gas and the dust is only around for on average about 3 million years, almost never more than 10 million years. And so how can planets form that fast? That's really the, the center question about plan uh, building planets. And so here's the timeline uh, that we are looking at today. This is the same basic timeline that I'll show every lecture. And today we're just going to look at that tiny, tiny stripe that I just put in there, the first five million years after the first solids. Starting from just dust and gas, how are the whole range of rocky, gas-rich, and also icy planets built? And what parts of this process do we have good evidence for, and what is still poorly understood? Uh, I want to start by going back into the historical views about how planets were formed, mainly because I think this is such a beautiful picture, I just love to show it. So uh, a philosopher, Emanuel Spadenborg, may, uh, wrote in his beautiful book, uh, uh, Principia Rerum Naturalium, in 1734, what his idea was about where planets came from. And his idea was that the planets came forth from the sun by means of a sort of a centrifugal expulsion. Uh, and he was followed in that idea by the philosopher Kant, who also talked about how planets were formed and then by Laplace, this kind of replaced the idea that planets came from outside the solar system and just wandered in to join the sun, which was kind of ad hoc idea. Um, even uh, George Darwin, who was Charles's son, got into the game and suggested that planets were removed from the sun by a loss of angular momentum through tides. He was really big on tides, George Darwin. He went, wrote a wonderful book on tides. And uh, that was this whole idea of planets more or less coming from the same material as the sun uh, persisted, and eventually we did learn about protoplanetary disks and understood that there was gas and dust in a great big disk. And, uh, and so Safranov, Russian scientist at the Schmidt Institute of Physics of the Earth in Moscow, really laid the foundation for modern planetary formation in his 1969 book. And uh, this, I, I, I bought a copy of this book, the, or the translation of this book, translated from the Russian by the Israeli translation service, uh, the evolution of the protoplanetary disk and the formation of Earth and the planets. And you can see that instead of those beautiful sort of hallucinatory pictures of spheres and circles and things spinning, uh, really the pages are filled with equations. And so we've moved into the world of modern mathematics and physics to try to explain this. All right, so where are we in the series of understanding where planets come from? So here on the left are the things we've talked about already, uh, the gas and dust in the disk and the first solids in the form of these calcium aluminum inclusions. That's actually the picture from that Allende that I showed. And here on the right end is a planet. And you can see from my schematic that I'm implying that small bodies, three small bodies here and two bigger bodies, the small bodies are called planetesimals. And for those of you who haven't run into that word before, it's really one of my favorite. It just means tiny planets, obviously. These are, these are bodies that are just tens to hundreds of kilometers in radius, sort of the size of a state. Um, and, uh, and, and they're thought to kind of add up into embryos, planetary embryos like that big one there, and up into the larger planets. 
Um, but what happens in the middle? We have little pebbles on the left-hand side, and then we have planetesimals. And in between, I draw an asterisk, um, something I've done for some years now. And I joke that it's the universal scientific symbol for, and then a miracle occurs. Uh, because there are two mysteries in that asterisk, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The first mystery is, how do planetesimals form? How do you actually get dust and tiny pebbles to stick together into something that's the size of Massachusetts? And then the other question is, how are the planets built so quickly? They have to be built very, very fast while the gas and dust just still exists. So those are the two mysteries, the ones that are inhabited in that asterisk. The other thing to look at in this picture uh, of the planetesimals and the planets is where it's red. And you see the exterior of the planet on the right is red. That's meant to mean that it's molten. And I'm showing there uh, the concept of the magma ocean. Uh, and that is the topic of the next lecture and one of my favorite things and the topic of my own research for years. The fact that for every rocky planet, multiple times in its formation, it was actually melted and so that it was a ball of magma in space. And, th and that melting occurs from giant impacts, accretionary impacts bodies the size of embryos like Mars hitting into bodies the size of Earth and melting them through that energy. But look at the left hand most planetesimal. It has red on its inside, meaning it's melted on the inside. We know that a lot of planetesimals melted. And that's something we're going to talk about for a moment. It turns out to be very important in this whole story. All right, so let's have a tiny quiz because what is a lecture without a quiz? Uh, why did planetesimals melt? So here are three options because everything was molten in the early solar system, because impacts between bodies melted them when they impacted, and because back then there was a common radioactive element that now no longer exists. And so I know that a number of you know the answer, but I just like to put it that way because it sounds so ridiculous, doesn't it? And so uh, the first one actually is really interesting. I wrote it down because it seemed like well, of course, the inside, the inner edge of the disk, we saw this in graphics last time, was very, very hot. So maybe everything started out molten. Well, this is not the canonical answer in the planetary community right now. We know that a lot of materials came together in pebble form, not in molten form, like those calcium aluminum inclusions. They were not melted at the time that they were uh, accreted into the material that became that meteorite. They were solid. But when I wrote this down, I thought to myself, maybe some things did accrete molten. And so for, for those of you who are, in fact, planetary scientists, I, I know Scott's here, some other people are here. This is something I'm actually following up on right now because maybe some things were accreted molten. It's an interesting question. It's not because impacts between bodies melted them. That only works for planets. For planetesimals and little things like the size of Massachusetts, the energy of their impacting each other is not enough to melt them. So it turns out the best answer is because back then there was a common radioactive element that now no longer exists, the thing that sounds like science fiction. So that is the element 26 aluminum. Its half-life is only 717,000 years. So it's half, so after about five half-lives, all of them a radioactive material is gone. It's all, uh, ra it's all decayed into 26 magnesium, which is its daughter product. And so in meteorites today, people find 26 magnesium, that atom, in crystals where really only aluminum should fit. And so this is how Jerry Wasserberg and others discovered that there was this ancient, short-lived radioactive element that actually would have created enough melt, enough heat to melt planetesimals. And so that's how we think the first cores formed in the solar system, by being heated up by 26 aluminum, which no longer exists. Um, really, really interesting um, problem, I think. So let's look at what that might have looked at like. On the left here, we have um, effectively the pebbles, chondrules, these, these things that were like blobs of, uh, of magma almost in the early solar system, calcium aluminum inclusions, those things the ages come from, dust. They accreted into planetesimals. That left-hand most planetesimal that says chondritic, meaning that its chondrules are still visible, its little sedimentary particles from the early solar system, unmelted primitive material from the, from the disk straight from the disk. And then in the middle is one that partly melted on the inside from aluminum 26 heat, and on the right one that melted all the way. And they've gone through what's called differentiation. The metal in them drained into the center to make a metal core, leaving the rock as the external mantle. That's the same form as our Earth had, but it happened first in planetesimals. And then 
A lot of these planetesimals were accreted into planets in a way we'll discuss in a moment. Others of them were broken up through impacts instead of collected together, they were actually broken through impacts. And some of them ended up as asteroids in the asteroid belt. And pieces of those asteroids fall to Earth now as meteorites. So in a moment, we're gonna focus on this accretion question, because recall that's one of our particular mysteries for this lecture. But first I wanna show you some of the evidence from asteroids, or really from meteorites that have fallen to the Earth, about these processes in planetesimals. So here you can see on the top right, I'm talking about a parent body that, that gave us these rocks that was melted and differentiated into a metal core and a rocky exterior. Meteorites that come from differentiated parents are called achondrites if they're rocky, meaning they're chondrules, those little sedimentary pieces are, are, are completely remelted and recrystallized, and iron meteorites. And so on the left, there's an iron meteorite that is the core, a piece of the core of a planetesimal a tiny failed planet from early in the solar system. And on the right, this is a rock that actually came from the asteroid Vesta and was delivered to the Earth uh, uh, through um, the amazing effect of having an impact into Vesta that shattered piece of it off, that went through space and ended up in the gravity well of Earth sucked onto our surface for us to find. So that's a, those, are, those are meteorites that show us that they were differentiated, fully melted and differentiated planetesimals. And then there are also meteorites from unmelted, undifferentiated parents. And this is an example of one called an enstatite chondrite. And I kind of love this one because uh, the enstatite chondrites are our geochemists' best guess for the raw material that built the Earth and, and possibly the other rocky planets too. It's kind of like if the Earth is a cake, then the enstatite chondrites are the flour and the eggs. And so um, we even have this sneaking hope uh, that one of the alternative ideas of what the asteroid psyche might be is it actually could be the parent body of the enstatite chondrites. And so when our mission gets there in 2026, we hope to be able to answer this question. And so here we are looking at this, uh, this meteorite that contains that that's almost sedimentary material from the early disk, just little pebbles and chondrules. So to make a planetesimal like the one that gave us this meteorite, we have to get the calcium aluminum inclusions and the chondrules and the dust and all the little bits of things in the disk to clump together. This is not so easy. Uh, within the first, say, one to two million years, almost all the material of the disk is in pebbles. And then the mystery, mystery is, how do we get from dust and pebbles to planetesimals? It's not really obvious. And so this is mystery number one. How do planetesimals form? The first thing I want to tell you is that pebbles are too big to clump together from Coulomb forces. So what is a Coulomb force? It's the attraction of oppositely charged objects. And in this case, I'm looking at, at two tiny dust bunnies. So dust bunnies often have what we would call static electricity. And in fact, they stick together. And that's sticking together from Coulomb forces. Now, what about pebbles? Will pebbles be held together by Coulomb forces? Well, OK, this is just a silly graphic for visual impact but the strength and the range of Coulomb forces can't hold pebbles together. And so that is not how planetesimals were formed out of the little grains in the early solar system. So the next force we could consider is gravity. But it turns out that pebbles are too small for gravity. Uh, keep in mind that these pebbles in this dust are orbiting the proto-sun. They're moving through space with some relative velocity between themselves, and they need to collide together and stick to make bigger objects. So just as the two rocks that you can hold in your hand don't stick together through mutual gravity, the pebbles in the small rocks orbiting in space don't either. And in fact, when they hit each other orbiting in space, most collisions between bodies, say 10 centimeters to a meter are destructive. In other words, they hit each other and they break into more pieces far from actually sticking together. And really virtually all collisions above a meter in size are destructive. So this is called the meter barrier. How do you get objects beyond a meter size to stick together? So here is some important context. This is a computer model of a cross section of a planetary, protoplanetary disk. The biggest particles in orange sink to the middle of the disk. Some slightly smaller ones in purple are there in the middle too. And then the tiniest dust grains and the gas all around it are like the bread in the sandwich. This is a sandwich made of gas with a dust and pebble filling. And so this is the context. Disks have dust and pebbles in the middle and gas on the outside. 
Now, larger particles fall into the sun very quickly because they're orbiting the sun, but they get slowed down by drag from the gas that they're passing through. And smaller particles are pushed out of the solar system by radiation pressure from the star. So the dust lifetime of the disk is short. And we're going to come back to that and talk about it in a moment. But in the next slide, you're going to see a picture or a film, really, a computer model made into a video of a protoplanetary disk viewed from that viewpoint, as if you are the sun and you're looking out at the disk. All right, so here is this video. This is a, a video from um, Johansson, Henning, and Klar. Uh, it's a first step of an idea of how planetesimals form. Now, again, imagine that you are the sun looking out at the disk, and this model wraps around. In other words, the right-hand end connects to the left-hand end. And you're going to see in a moment, as I start this, that the pebbles, rocks, and boulders are all moving into the middle, and they're surrounded by gas, and then they start a turbulence. And this turbulence can actually create clumps in the pebbles and, um, and the dust uh, that clumps them up into what we think may be a way to create planetesimals. Um, this is a really interesting kind of turbulence, and it's caused by the fact that, that, that the bread of this sandwich, the gas, is orbiting at a certain speed, and the pebbles and the dust in the middle, the filling of the sandwich, are orbiting at a different speed. And so you can imagine that creates shear between the two layers that are orbiting at different speeds, and then you get these instabilities that build up and create uh, planetesimals. Now, there are related kinds of instabilities um, called streaming instabilities that are another way possibly to clump dust and pebbles together. So these are really the first legitimate, like reasonable ways that we could think that planetesimals could be created. And this is very recent stuff. You know, this is this paper is 14 years old. And so uh, in the time since I got my PhD in 2002, really this, this kind of um, theory has come along. And before this, the meter barrier was, was pretty absolute. People did not have a good idea. So this is our best idea for an answer to mystery number one. Planetesimals form by the instabilities that clump material together. Okay, so then mystery two is how are planets built so quickly? So now we can make planetesimals, but how much time do we have to make planets? Recall that the larger particles are falling into the star and the smaller ones are being pushed out by radiation pressure. So how long does that gas and dust disk stay around. We'd like to know the average time the, dust, the disk survives. So this graph right now from Hernandez et al. 2008, the vertical axis is the frequency at which a star has, um, has a disk if it's the age given on the horizontal axis. So the age on the horizontal axis goes from 0 million years to about 10 million years old. These are young, young stars that we're looking at out in our galaxy. And you can see that if you look down near zero, almost all of those stars have got disks. And then as you go to older and older ages, by about 10 million years, the disks are gone. And so on average, that is when 50% of the stars have disks, this is that line, and it would encompass about that amount of the data. And so between say 1.5 and 4 million years, or people often just say 3 million years, that's the average time that a disk survives. So planets have to be built by 3 million years, and on the outside by 10 million years, or else all the stuff we have to build them is gone. And so it's only very recently uh, that quite a good theory has come along to explain how this could happen. And this is called pebble accretion. And you can see um, a lot of the key people who have discovered and developed this theory down at the bottom, Ormel and Klar in 2010, and Lambrex and Johansson in 2012, and Kretke and Levison in 2014. And there, there are quite a number of additional people working on this problem, but these were some of the key people who developed this theory. It's very, very new. And so here's the idea. You can see on the left, um, the, the blue is, is gas, and then there's a protoplanet, a, a, you know, a small planet that's just been growing, and a, and a little pebble, and they're near each other, orbiting near each other. And you can see the pebble uh, spins in and joins the protoplanet. So why would this happen really efficiently only at this time in the solar system? The pebble has to be affected by gas drag to slow it down, and then the protoplanet has to be big enough that it has enough gravity to pull it in. And if those two things are true, the growth is very, very fast, and planets can build uh, before the disk is gone. And so in this graph I'm showing you, on the vertical axis, the mass of the body that's being grown, and its mass has a function of the mass of the Earth. If you see that little subscript on the vertical axis that looks like a plus sign in a circle, that means the Earth. 
And so if you look at 10 to the zero, which is the same as one, you see I wrote Earth next to it. So that's one Earth mass. And then you go lower on that scale and you get to smaller bodies like the moon or Ceres or just a little hundred kilometer body. So that vertical axis is size. The horizontal axis is years. And so 10 to the fifth is 100,000 and 10 to the sixth is a million years. And so this is happening very fast, a million years. Note that the models that were run that are shown here in blue, they all start with bodies that are larger than 100 kilometers. So this only works if you've already made planetesimals through another process, presumably instabilities. But look what happens. As soon as that body is there in the gas disk with pebbles around it, accretion goes so fast, all of those lines just go vertical. And so uh, you can see that if you start at, at, at 100,000 years with something like um, almost the size of Ceres, it grows into the size of the Earth in almost no time. So by 100,000 years after the first pebbles, Moon and Mars-sized embryos have formed and we're rapidly getting on toward things like the size of the Earth. So what about the big outer planets? So once a body reaches about 10 times Earth mass, runaway gas accretion leads to Jupiter's in less than 100,000 years. So if you can make planetesimals really fast through instabilities, then you immediately get these rocky planetary cores and it makes all the rocky planets that we know. And then if you're in the outer solar system, you, the rocky planet core, then you immediately suck to yourself through gravity all of this gas and you create a Jupiter in less than 100,000 years. And voila, we have a way to make all the planets we need to before the disk disperses. And Hal Levison said, uh, he had a quote, it wasn't even clear how objects like Jupiter or Saturn could exist at all. And it was also true for the rocky planets when we had the one meter barrier. We knew we're standing on a planet, they had to exist, but we didn't have any physics that explained it. And so here is a beautiful picture of a protoplanetary disk. The gaps in it are likely caused by forming planets even though the disk still exists. So this is a beautiful, beautiful disk doing exactly what we've just described in this lecture, uh, collecting material through pebble accretion and forming a whole suite of beautiful planets. And so finally, here we are back with our, um, with our timeline, talking about just the first, say, five million years after the first solids. We've taken pebbles, uh, out, like this calcium aluminum inclusion, and we've used instabilities of various kinds to make planetesimals very, very fast within a first 100,000 years. Then we immediately build up uh, something the size of like the moon or Mars, and then pebble accretion takes off, makes the rocky planets, makes Jupiter and Saturn. I have question marks after both of these because even though these are plausible and they're the leading hypotheses at the moment, they may not be right in the long run. Now, next time, I'm gonna talk about magma oceans. So what happens when these rocky planets start out completely molten, balls of molten rock in space, an idea that I've always thought was incredibly poetic and irresistible. And that'll be the next lecture next Thursday. Thank you very much.